Well, hello, hello, everybody out there in the Committed 100. Welcome to Systematic Theology and looking at saving faith today. Uh, what is faith? As we've been looking at this journey now for four weeks in Systematic Theology on what is faith. Um, with that, you guys won't see my face. Um, hopefully the lighting's a little bit better now. Uh, this is pre-recorded. This is recorded Thursday night. Um, as Friday, Christy and I have a journey to do for her and for her health. But with that, join us. Make sure you guys have your cups of coffee, ka-chink. And you've got your pens, paper, highlighters, Bibles as we take a look at saving faith today. And if you guys can still hear me, as you should, join me on our screen as we've looked at what historical faith has generally meant usually that comes with traditions and come to, come with a lot of if ands or buts especially in the roman catholic faith the faith comes with um, doing of the sacraments and of traditions and of accepting of what uh, the tradition of the church what the pope in rome says plus a quote unquote what the bible says as long as it's interpreted infallibly by the church there's a miraculous type of faith, a faith that comes from seeing the miraculous, seeing a miracle, seeing something that should not occur, which we see in the Bible occurs many times with many that, of the crowds that follow Jesus after miracle, but then immediately fall away once things get tough. If you guys remember correctly, there comes a point in which the crowd stopped following Jesus and Jesus turns around to his boys and he says, are you going to leave as well? That's the, a often quote unquote miraculous type of faith. And then there's the temporal faith. There's the faith that seems to be there for a time seems operative word in that sentence, but then seems to go, fade away to disappear um, much less we could easily look at the parable of the sower and the seed and most of them being temporal and only one being that true saving faith. And that's what number or letter D that we're going to be looking at today is true saving faith. True saving faith is a faith that has its seat in the heart and is rooted in the regenerate life. Once again, going back to the bigger picture of systematic theology is looking at a regenerate life that then shows faith. Is showing the cause and reaction of God regenerating a person, the Holy Spirit coming into their lives and bringing of them faith and repentance, and then that outpouring of their lives of showing their faith by their works. Uh, the perfect marriage of what both Paul and of what James says is true. And that's what we're looking for in this true saving faith. Not a faith that just says, uh, as most of you know, I'm working on my thesis on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And no less than five times in 1 John chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. Excuse me, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. We see the if. And often that if is combined with if a person says... But that saying needs to be combined with doing something that they parapeteo, that they walk in. A distinction is often made between the habitus, the habits, and the actus of faith. Is it a reality? Is it something that is consistent? Is it consistent with your actions? Is it consistent with your lifestyle? Is what Burkhoff is asking. The distinction needs to be made between the two, but the two are related and go together. Back of both of these, however, lies the semen fide, the seed of faith. This faith is not, is not first of all an activity of man, but a potentiality wrought by God in the heart of the sinner. 
In other words, in the process of regeneration, man is given this seed of faith that is all that they need. It is a gift from God that mankind is dead in their trespasses and sin and cannot choose God and would not choose God. But in the process of regeneration, they are given this gift, this seed of faith that then blooms into a regenerate life. The seed of faith is implanted in man in regeneration. Some theologians speak of this as the habitus of faith, but others more correctly call it the semen fide, um, the seed of faith. It is only after God has implanted the seed of faith in the heart that man can exercise faith. This is where, this is going to rub some of you guys wrong, and just realize that it's Chris pointing out what scripture says, and in this case, agreeing with Burkhoff, and that man in and of himself could not, would not on a boat, could not, would not in a moat, could not, would not in a church, could not, would not in a cathedral. In other words, man cannot choose or exercise faith in and of themselves. It needs to be a gift from God because they are morally and spiritually bankrupt before regeneration. Now, obviously, quoting Dr. Seuss there for a bit because of things going on in our culture and our society right now with cancel culture, making somewhat of a joke, but it's certainly true. Mankind would not, could not, in fact, cannot, as we see throughout Scripture. When the Bible speaks of faith, it generally refers to faith as an activity of man, through born, though born of the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the important distinction that we need to make as preachers and teachers and as believers. So often our, our preaching, our teaching, and in fact our, some of our quote-unquote gospel calls, quote-unquote altar calls, have been on the basis of, well, just choose Jesus. Do we know without a shadow of a doubt who God has given regeneration to? Do we without a shadow of a doubt know in whom the Holy Spirit is working gifts of faith and repentance in which has been given the semen fide, this seed of faith? No, we don't know 100% for sure. So how is it that we can give this general call to just put your trust in Jesus and everything will be all right? Can we know someone just from their words spoken in desperation, as we've looked at, or words spoken out of a, a, a moral conviction about their sin? How do we know? that truly indeed they've been given the gifts of faith and repentance, that truly indeed the Spirit of God is moving in them. It takes time. It's not a one and done. It's not just a come on down after 10 million rounds of just as I am. No, no, no. It's it's time. It's patience. It's uh, working through these things with them in, in the word, explaining to them this process in which hopefully, prayerfully, God is going through with them. And that if indeed, truly, that this has become a part of who they are, that if indeed they are in the process of sanctification after coming to faith, then they will want to know the, this process. They will want to know what God has done. If they don't want to know, it's probably one of the first evidences that maybe, in fact, the Holy Spirit has not is not, will not work in their lives. And it was just an emotional reaction or, or, a, or a plea for help or a peer pressure that all oh, my friends are going down to the front. I'll go down to the front with them. No, 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 no. That's not what we are interested as preachers of the gospel. What we want is to see that man or woman being regenerated by the power and the spirit of God to bring them, give them the gifts of faith, to give them the gift of repentance and for them to seek out for themselves, the reality of what God has done. 
Saving faith may be defined as a certain conviction wrought in the heart by the Holy Spirit as to the truth of the gospel and a hearty reliance or trust on the promises of God in Christ. Hence the sanctification that comes afterwards in looking at these things and growing in Christ also means growing in the knowledge of what God has done, not just resting upon it as a once and done event, but growing in it and knowing, expanding our understanding and our appreciation of what God has done in through the gift and through the gift of not only just regeneration, calling us out of the ground, out of the grave, as it were, into giving us flesh and bones and blood and sinews, into giving us the ability to place our faith and trust in him and what he has done. In the last analysis, it is true, Christ is the object of saving faith. I'm going to say this again because it bears repeating. Christ is the object of saving faith. But he is only offered to us, but he is only he, he is offered to us only in the gospel. Not outside of the gospel. Just come to Jesus and it, it's not everything's going to be peachy keen without the presentation of the gospel. You're a sinner in need of a savior, come to Jesus. See, American Christianity especially certain forms of Baptist and Pentecostal and, and other is and isms has presented a false gospel and that come to Jesus and everything will be great and be pretty versus instead just come to Christ. Christ is the object of saving faith, not the benefits, not the ulterior motives often attached with it. some elements of true faith as we look at it. How do we understand if someone is has in fact shown true faith? That it's not just a parable of the sower where it catches ground for a while and quickly dies or is choked out by the cares of the world. There is an intellectual element Yes, our, our Pentecostal friends and, and other friends want to emphasize the emotional element, but God has created us soul, body, and spirit. That we are not just one or the other. That in fact, when God calls us, he calls us as a part of each of those elements of how he created us. And one of those elements is intellectual, to agree with the spiritual and the emotional about what God is doing. When we talk about the intellectual element, there's three different subsections we're going to look at. What is the character of this knowledge? How is it that we know, gnosis, knowledge, about what God has done? And Paul, or at least in my opinion, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen is faith. We can have assurance of these things that are hoped for. That's intellectual. As well as a conviction, a, a trusting of things not seen. These are the intellectual elements that go along with this seed of true faith that is married to the intellectual, the spiritual, and the emotional aspects of our lives. If someone is coming to the church or comes to the, the front and says, oh, I've accepted Jesus, it's not solely based on one of these three elements, intellectual, spiritual, or emotional. It needs to be the whole person. We need to be preaching a holistic gospel, not in the sense of going to go use um, as some type of diet drink and some essential oils, that not that type of holistic, but in body, soul, and spirit. We need to be preaching a holistic gospel, treating the whole man and not just the emotions, not just appealing to their emotions. We need to present the gospel intellectually. We need to present the gospel spiritually, 
And yes, we also need to present the gospel emotionally. We're going to start getting into, especially next week, how do we do that? But we need to understand that these aspects are a part of the gospel call to then understand how they work in the life of the Christian. How is it that we appeal to the scriptures on intellectual, emotional, and spiritual levels? Number two, we need to look at the certainty of this knowledge. The second half of the verse gives us this, the conviction of things not seen, that there's a, a certainty, that there's a trust in what God has done. This is part of the intellectual, is that placing of that trust, that surety, that certainty of this knowledge. But as we know in our current culture and our society, that our culture has given up certainty for security has given up certainty for security. Dr. White talks about this all the time, the very fact that we will give up of our rights and responsibility, things in which we, our founding fathers and, and our spiritual fathers have passed down to us, we have abandoned for the sake of safety, of feeling secure, but without a certain knowledge of anything. In fact, I was just speaking, I don't remember to who today. Uh, oh, speaking to one of my board members today about the fact that certain non-denominational -denomin non denominations have exchanged the certainty of the gospel for saying that, well, as a true born-again believer, you can lose your salvation. That it can be lost, to, gained today and lost tomorrow. What is the certainty of that type of knowledge? You're, you immediately lose any intellectual element to the gospel call. You lose this intellectual element of truth because if it's not certain, if, if there's no standard by which it, it can be both knowable and something to be stood upon, then our intellectual certainty fades away. Then even more, the emotional call to, well, you need to come to church to feel connected with God and feel as though you're really saved. And then when you lose that emotional connection, your intellectual is already eroded because you have no intellectual knowledge that your church leaders are saying, well, you can, you can lose your salvation tomorrow or the day after. Where's your surety? Where's the certainty, the assurance of things that are hoped for and a conviction and a belief, a firm standing on things not seen? When one of these elements, intellectual, emotional and spiritual are neglected and eroded the whole basis of the doctrine of salvation including faith goes out the window what is the measure of this knowledge dr manchin who generally speaking i would disagree with says what to put it baldly or plainly are the minimum doctrinal requirements in order that a man may be a Christian? This is a legitimate question, even though I generally don't agree with Dr. Manchin. What is the measure of the knowledge that we have to have in order to have this type of surety in this intellectual element? You know, as Paul says, how much assurance and conviction do we need to have of the things hoped for and the things not seen? Actually, not a whole lot. What intellectual elements, what measure was given to the disciples? Jesus comes up and says, follow me. And then over the next three and a half years begins to explain to them the nature of the salvation that they will receive. Have they laid hands on it yet? I don't think so. 
for many of them, it wasn't until after his resurrection that they had laid true hold of faith. So then you're telling me, Chris, that the minimal doctrinal requirements for in order for someone to really to be a Christian is the bars low. Yes. But that doesn't mean that they're going to stay low. And that's the big problem in American Christianity and especially American Christianity, I get to pick on them because I live in America, is that the preaching from the pulpit had all, has always set the bar so low and kept the bar low. Oh, just come to Jesus and everything will be fine. And the, all this Bible stuff, oh, well, you don't really need to know it. Yeah, It's nice if you do. It'd be nice if you come to Bible study. It'd be nice to do all these things, but it's not something that is required. Is that the option that was given to the disciples? No. He says, come and follow me, which included what? Listening to his teachings. Listening to him describe faith and trusting in God. Seeing of his miracles and trusting him for provision of food and shelter, of guidance into the next town. The disciples, the boys, got a hands-on, one-on-one discipleship with Jesus for three and a half years. And yet, as we look at this measure of knowledge, Modern Christians, the bar has been set so low that they never rise above it. No wonder there's so much confusion about, am I saved or am I not saved? Am I really following the true Jesus or am I following an, a, a different Christ? As Dr. Howard was mentioning this morning, when the knock comes at the door, hello, where are the... The guys in the, the white shirts with the bikes to tell you about a different Jesus. Oh, hey, we're this other group that likes to travel in two by twos and is made up of formerly quote unquote Baptist people. Oh, let me tell you, uh, we're, we're also called Christians, but we worship on Saturday. Oh, and by the way, you really need to follow the, the Old Testament laws and covenants, including the dietary restrictions. Oh, hey, we're this new group down the street that's following this great charismatic leader. And we need to tell you about the secrets that are in the Bible. This is how many people have been led astray misguided over the years because of this low bar both in faith in entrance as well as the rest of their quote-unquote christian life no many so many are being led astray or as mrs howard has been talking about silly women that are so easily led astray because the bar has been so low I want to look at the emotional element of this for a moment. In the Heidelberg Catechism, a, a teaching a, to catechize those that are coming into the faith. This is one of the things that especially American Christianity for the last 150 years has ditched at the side of the road, so to speak. You guys are going to hear the alarm in the background. I apologize. Out here in Phillips, South Dakota at noon and at 10 p.m., the tornado sirens go off to mark the time we've ditched catechizing believers in putting them in a program that is structured for them to learn and to grow and to ask questions what we now call discipleship in previous centuries there would be things such as the heidelberg catechism or the baptist catechism which would slowly but surely go through the doctrinal statement of the church, whether it be the London Baptist Confession of 1689 or the um, 1646 or any other doctrinal statement of faith. 
Now, there is somewhat of a renaissance coming to that, but I, I don't think it's being used by many churches. There's the um, New City Catechism, which isn't really catching on. But um, tsh. The Heidelberg Catechism, when it says about true faith, it's not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for true all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also a hearty trust in which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel. So there's both sides. There's a certain knowledge about all that God has revealed to us in his word. Now, that word is being revealed to us slowly but surely and growing piece by piece, those that are being catechized. But also trusting in the Holy Spirit and what she's working in me, the, the message of the gospel and what I have received and what I trust in that is then being shored up and built up by the knowledge that is being dispensed to me about what God has revealed to us in his word. Does this take time? Yes. And yet we have expected, number one, for it to be immediate. And number two, for there not to be any hiccups along the road. Many churches think that when somebody becomes a Christian that you can just download all this knowledge immediately like the Matrix. I really wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. It takes time. After I became a Christian, I would say that I really didn't have a good hold of what salvation really was or or what God had, had been doing and was doing for five years, maybe. Maybe even a little longer. It took time. And it took going from a church, going to a church that said that I could be, not be saved that next second, to going to a church that then said, yes, you are saved, but here's the reality. Here, let's study together. Let us work together as to your understanding physically, emotionally, or mentally, emotionally, and spiritually what God has done. There's the volitional element, the last one. This is the crowning element of faith. Faith is not merely a matter of the intellect, nor the intellect and the emotions, but also a matter of the will. Now, this is where, this is going to rub some of you raw, especially you free will Baptists out there, um, <laughs> determining the direction of the soul. An act of the soul going out towards its object and appropriating this, in other words, faith. Without this activity of the object of faith, which the sinner recognizes as true and real and entirely applicable to his present needs, remains outside of him. In other words, to boil down what Burkhoff is saying, that until the regenerative work of the spirit, which includes the mind, the soul, and the spirit, the, the mind, the heart, and the will. Mankind is unable to exercise that will in a proper way. That his will is bound in sin until it is released in regeneration to then choose God. This third element consists of personal trust in Christ as Savior and Lord, including a surrender of the soul as guilty and defiled to Christ and a reception and appropriation of Christ as the source of the pardon and of spiritual life. Taking all of these elements, the, the mind, the, the emotion, and the spirit together, it's quite evident that the seed of faith cannot be placed in the intellect, nor in the feelings, nor in the will exclusively, but in the heart, in the, in the, the core of man, in truly who he is that then affects and affects the intellect, the feelings, and the wills, as I've been saying this whole evening. When we talk about this general faith, 
is the object of the whole divine revelation is contained in the word of God. Everything that is explicitly taught in scripture or can be deduced from it by good and necessary inference belongs to the object of faith in this general sense. In other words, having faith and this gift of faith says that, yes, I believe these things, but I need to dig deeper to truly understand them. And then in the special faith or the special revelation of God, this is saving faith in the more limited sense of the word. While true faith in the Bible as the word of God is absolutely necessary, that is not yet the specific act of faith which justifies and therefore saves directly, it must and as a matter of fact does not lead to a more special faith. There are certain doctrines concerning Christ and his work and certain promises made to him to sin, made in him to sinful men which the sinner must receive and which must lead him to put his trust in Christ. This is the gospel. Not just death, burial, resurrection. This is connecting the, the scarlet thread that goes from Genesis to Revelation about what God has done, is doing, and will do in the life of the believer. The object of special faith then is Jesus Christ and the promise of salvation through him. Once again, the object of faith is always Jesus Christ and his the promise of salvation through him. Not an emotional plea. Not a gimme, 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 what can Jesus give me? Not Jesus get me out of this predicament I'm in. But it's always the focus of true faith is Jesus Christ and the promise of true salvation from ourselves, from the penalty of sin, eternal, sub, eternal punishment than to belief in Jesus and eternal life and of serving him. Jesus presents it himself is the last thing we're going to look at it on saving faith today. I wanted to look at four specific passages, specifically in the Greek, to get away from traditional ists and isms to then what does the text say? Stick to the text, as a Bible study teacher of mine used to say all the time, whenever we would get on a wild tangent. All right, back to the text, like stick to the text. There's something in the Greek called a hina clause. Those first three letters with that apostrophe on it, at the, there, John 3, 15. Hina, uh, sometimes translated therefore or because. Because. Pas, ho, pasuan. All who believe, all of the better translating, all of the believing ones, because they believe, they're included in the all. But all are not believing. It's not a both and proposition. There, there is no equivalency on both sides of the equation. You have to have belief, this pursuon, in order to be included in the all, in John 3.15. These are Jesus' words himself. So if you're going to have an issue with uh, certain doctrines that are contained in the Bible, take it up with Jesus. Ask Jesus why he used such specific and inclusive language and specific language when, when talking to Nick at night as Dr. Howard says, why is that henna clause there is to be very specific about the action and the purpose and the people of faith. But Jesus doesn't just do it once. Three times, no less, in three verses within the same context, he then in John 3.16, pas ha pursuant, those who believe, those who have this face, this Pistis, pistuon, being a form of pistis, faith. Those who believe, not the whosoever. Most English translations, including the King James, translate these as whoever. Well, it can't be just whoever because it's extremely specific. Number one, the Hina clause starts this argument in 15. 
But Jesus says, yes, all, the all, the pos is, is all, and pos means all, all the time, but all of what? These three times, all of the believing ones, those that believe. Well, not all are going to believe. So then this is a subsection. This is a subset. This is a special group of people who believe that are from the all. Jesus continues it again. The ha pastuon in John 3, 18. But Jesus gets even more specific in John chapter 6, verse 40. Hina pas ha theron, those that look to him, ton huion, the son, kai pasuan, and believe. So hina, because those who look at and those who believe the son. So Jesus is even more specific about those who, number one, receive faith, but those that are included in the all, those looking and those believing in John 640. Those looking and those believing. What is it that they're looking to in John chapter 6? Oh, yes, that's right. Jesus just got done describing Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And those that they're on looked to the serpent were saved. And now Jesus says, Hina, just in the way those that had seen the serpent were saved, Hina, all the looking ones thereon to the sun, Ton Huion, and what? Pishuan, belief. Those that are considered in the on are the ones looking to the cross as their source of salvation, not themselves. The passage has nothing to do with what man can do, only those looking and believing in what the cross says about them and their relationship with God. Those are the all. Those are the all in John 3.15. Those are the all the pos in 3.16. Those are the ha pastuon in 3.18. And those are the pas ha theron and kai pastuon in John 6.40. No, no wonder then in John 20 that doubting Thomas can say, the Lord of me and the God of me. Uh, on Theos Ton Oh no, Kai Ton Soter The Lord of me and the God of me In the same way in John 6.40 Jesus is saying Hina pas ha Theron, ton, huion, kai, pusuon. Those who look to me, those who believe in me, those are the all. The all what? Who will be saved? John 3.15, John 3.16, John 3.18. I know this connection. I know the dependence upon this English translation and the ists and isms surrounding it, especially the King James Version only, folks. Sorry, this is going to rub you the wrong way. But the you can't get around the language in which John, uh, John records specifically the Lord himself telling you who the all is and what the evidence of the all is, is the believing ones. Not anyone else. This isn't universalism. This is specific faith in both Hotheron, looking to, and Kai Pesuron, and believing. This is the gospel, folks. For those of you preachers out here, this is the gospel. Those that look to and those that believe in the gospel. Those that are given the gifts of faith and repentance in which the Holy Spirit is working and has given them regeneration from being dead and now hina being included in Pasapishuan, the believing ones.
until we're able to let down our guards and our walls, our ists and our isms, this is going to rub you the wrong way. Your flesh is going to want to strike out and say, oh, no, no, Chris, this can't be, you know, my Bible says. But what are the words that John has recorded for us that the Lord says? Are you trusting in what Jesus has said or are you trusting in a translation? I'm being down to earth and honest here, folks. Are you trusting in, in a language or a Bible to save you? Are you trusting in the one who has said, look to me, look to the son and believe? That's the gospel. That's the message that needs to be preached from all of our pulpits Sunday morning. That's what needs to be taught Wednesday nights at, at Bible study or in youth group. That you might be included, the Hinnikos, in the all who look and believe. With that, stay tuned as we will be taking a look at next week, faith and assurance. How does assurance come with this faith? How do we know and not be like those that, quote unquote, believe one day and are gone the next? How does the, the parable of the sower fit in with this faith? How can we know that we're a part of the, the all and the henna, the, the because or the therefores? Looking forward to taking that journey with you starting next week. Stay tuned in just a little bit coming up church history and looking at the Council of Constance and the... Uh, judgment upon the early reformers with that may the lord bless you and keep you may he make his face shine upon you and give you rest this week see you all soon